a lifestyle business or a business that should grow and scale? I, I think that I, I think that really depends upon them. So, you know, some people are just happy to have a lifestyle business. You know, they, they can have a lifestyle business. They can take enough profits out of the lifestyle business to invest, to do other stuff, to, to protect themselves. I, I think it just really depends on, on, on the motivation of why you started the business in the first place. Uh, can good marketing fix bad mindset? I don't see why. I don't see why not. But it's very, very difficult. This is a, another thing that we have to remember for a business owner. There's so many things going on in their heads. They're not where we think they are. So I might, I might give him this lead magnet, and I'm like, okay, he's he's excited, he's ready to go. But it's actually not. If you were starting your business again now, what was what's the key thing that you would do? Oh, I think uh, I, I can tell you what I would do differently from when I started mine. Yeah. Uh, audience list. The list is the list is the critical. Um, I think we. Gold. I think a lot of us we we build a product and we try to find an audience for the product. I think the audience is much more. Get to know an audience. Mm -hmm. Get to know what they're looking for and what they want, and then build the solutions around that and be flexible about that. Welcome to this week's episode of the Ultimate Marketing Podcast with me, Sarah Cox, Vish Baba, and Danita Patney. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good to see everyone again. So today we will continue our conversation around all things marketing. So if you want to check out the latest marketing tips, insights, ninja tricks, then don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to all our channels. So we're on Spotify, Apple, Sketcher, and numerous other podcast platforms. We're also on YouTube, so you can actually watch us live speaking if you want instead of listening to us on a podcast. So just hit subscribe, and um, we look forward to sharing more episodes with you. So on to today's episode, we've got a very special guest with us today. So this special guest I met through a networking event. So it's amazing <laughs> what happens when you network with other people. So I met this special person on a networking event and I was telling him about our podcast and he said he'd very much like to come and chat along with us and share his wisdom with our community. So welcome, George Sotiropoulos. Thank you. <laughs> welcome, George. Welcome, George. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Mark. So quick intro on George and then I'll let him introduce himself. So George is a top notch business advisor who is passionate about providing business owners to, and helping them to grow a valuable business that gives them the life that they really want. So he helps them transform their companies into what he calls VIP businesses, V for valuable, I for independent and P for profitable so that they can achieve the fullest potential of their business and do what they really want to do. So welcome, George. So thank you. Thank you. I'm, come and tell us a little bit about you and what you it's do. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so my, name, my name's uh, as George Sotaropoulos. I think you did very well with the last name, by the way. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And so really, really what I do is um, I help business owners and I, I help them optimize their business. Now, I know that sounds very cliche, but... I help them do that by making their businesses sellable. Now, why is that important? It's important because even if they have no intention to sell the business anytime soon, when they make it sellable, they've optimized the business across all the different areas. You know, so you have your systems and processes working. You have, you're standing out from your competition. You know, you're able to control how you price. Uh, you have revenues that are much more predictable. And, and really, you have more of a life because you get to invest your time and where you want to invest it you know uh it, it's like when i when i talk to people i say look for the last few years jeff bezos was not packing boxes at amazon anymore you know um yeah he had a vision and and was able to implement it and and the, the reason why i got into this business actually it's actually kind of interesting it wasn't my original idea it, uh, to do this business i was looking at something else and i I was from a finance background. So originally I was going to just going to do, you know, how do you value a business so on and so forth and all this stuff. And I found out right away that most businesses, uh, even though they're profitable, when they go to sell, they're going to fail, you know, and the, the percentage was something like 70% or something like that. 
And so, oh. you know, you're looking at seven out of 10 who are counting on a sale. All of a sudden, you know, they're hoping to retire and they realize that they're going to pay the bills. They're not retiring anytime soon. And that's not mm. what they or their family signed up for when they're putting all those hours in all those decades to try to build it. Uh, and then on the last three out of 10, you know, uh, maybe two of them will sell, but it's going to be selling on the buyer's terms, you know, and, and again, it's not what they, what they signed up for. It's only going to be like the one out of 10 or even the one out of 20 who turn around, you know, and, and get the paycheck in their hands that could be five, 10 times more than what the business paid them across its entire life. Right. Um, and so when I saw that, you know, it just, it, it didn't feel right because, as a business owner, you're, you kind of have the odds stacked against you in many ways. You know, who does the government go after? They go after you. Yeah. Who are they going to find for like the, the tiniest infraction? They're going to get you, right? It's not going to be the big corporations. They're going to get away with everything. You know, you kind of, you're kind of shafted. You know, it's the, it's the whole thing like, um, you know, when Trump was running for president and he talked about how many contractors he stiffed, you know, he, he shafted. Like he, they did the work and he wouldn't pay them. And it wasn't just Trump. Mm. I see that all the time, you know, when you can get away with it, you just get away with it. And hey, that's tough luck, right? And so that's where this came from. I said, wait a minute, you know, um, you know, my parents at one time had a business. Um, some of my friends, you know, they come from, from, especially growing up in a Greek community in Chicago, a lot of them owned restaurants, which meant, you know, it was like my big factory wedding, right? But they, they were living at the <laughs> restaurant, you know, and and it's like, hey, they, they, they didn't sign up for that, you know? And so that's where I started this business to say, okay, how can we even those odds? How can we do something so that when the person has put all that work, hard work in, has built something, they're not giving it away to free for someone else. You know, they're, they're going to be able to say, this is my price. This is my terms. Hey, you know, I got three other people asking me about this. So, you know, are you in or are you out? Yeah. Especially when they put their um, blood, sweat, and tears in in building that business, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the, the, I mean, I I see it myself. You know, it's the sacrifices you make as you build the business. It's a weekend, and you're working on the business instead of being with the kids, right? Mm -hmm. Now you'll say, "Hey, I'm doing this for the children. I'm doing this," but you know, you want to have that payoff at the end. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want to sit there and say, "Oh crap, I should have just kept my job because." I would have had my weekends at least. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very true. What's a common marketing issue that your clients have, George? Oh, a big one is, uh, I, I sort of touched on it before, but they don't, they, they, they have a hard time knowing how to stand out, you know, and mm -hmm. then, and that leads to two things. One, they, they commoditize themselves very quickly, you know, so, so when someone says, oh, so-and-so, what do you do? They answer the question as if it was the tax man asking them what did they put on the tax form. And, and they don't realize that when they do that, they've commoditized themselves. So perfect example, yeah. I had, uh, funny enough, it was a marketing, uh, was a marketing agency. It was a, a, a woman who was specializing in um, Facebook and Instagram uh, advertising, selling that. And so we sat down, we were, in our, we were talking about our businesses and I asked her, so what does she do? And she said, I sell Facebook and Instagram advertising. And I said, okay, great. I go, so you and how many tens of thousands of others are doing that at the same time? And she looked at me kind of quizzically and I told her, you just, you just explained to me as if you were doing your taxes. Now, the problem with that is when you go to the market with that, well, what, what makes you different from all these others? You know, so who's the cheapest? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the cheapest. Why? Well, it doesn't matter. It's a commodity. It's like buying toilet paper. Who cares? Right? Um, yeah. So I, I, I said to her again, I said, so tell me about some of your client engagements. And, and she actually had some really cool engagements. She, she got some really good return on ad spend. She had some really good numbers behind her. Uh, and I literally said to her, like, okay, that's fantastic. I go, you know, what's your child's name? She gave me her child's name. I said, okay, that's the name of your method. You have the method named after your child. Uh, like I have a company named after my daughter. Um, <laughs> And this is, you know, and, and she was able to articulate what made her different and that Facebook and Instagram is just a tool that she's using to accomplish that return. And yeah. when she shifted 
instead of doing that, her quality of her customers became a lot better. She was able to get rid of some of the you know, kind of like the, the pain in the butt ones that were just sucking <laughs> yeah. up all her time and not giving her any money, right? And she was able to get real clients. Um, and I think that is a common, common issue. And it leads to it, it leads to pricing. You know, we all know pricing is always like, okay, how do I price? How should I price this? And often, like, what are the others doing? And it's like, well, who cares what the others are doing if if what you're producing, you can show that it stands apart and that it's superior, and that your customers love it and they come back again and again. Who cares, right? They're going to pay you for that. Mm. You know, it's the reason why. A fine dining Japanese restaurant can charge a lot more for sushi than, than the guy on the street, because mm -hmm. and people know that they're not shopping for price; they're shopping for the experience. And, yeah. And so I think yeah. I think for a lot of business owners, it's very it's very easy for them to get tied up in the features of what they're doing, and so one, it bores everyone to tears, and then two, they're they're, they're short they're short changing themselves, um, and so I think yes, I I, I would. I can go for hours on this, but that that happens <laughs> to be one of the biggest things, uh, which is why in, in, in my engagements, it's often the first thing that we tackle before we even tackle about mm. scaling the business. We tackle, OK, what makes you what makes whatever you're doing? Uh, why do your customers love it? The ones that you do have, you know, and yeah. let's see how we can find more like that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm going to ask my, one of my co-hosts now, like for what questions they've got. So, Dee, let's start with you. What questions have you got for George? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the questions that I had was very much around. Um, uh, so, obviously, you know, like you said, people don't always, when they start a business, they're not always thinking, "I'm going to start a business to sell." But I, I love what yeah. you said about the fact that even if you're not going to sell it, it needs to have value, doesn't it? So, if it was sellable, if you were were going to sell it there would be value in it for people to buy. So how do you get, especially like business owners who in their mind going, I don't want to sell this business. I want to pass it on or I want to keep working. How do you get them to think? What are the fundamental um, elements in their business that they need to start thinking like that? Well, a lot of it is what uh, I, I like to ask them, what's their life like today with the business? You know, so the first question I ask them is, do you own a business or do you own a job? You know. If you were to if you were to win the lottery tomorrow, would you uh, put a, a a sign on the door telling everyone to take a hike because hey it's closed and tough luck you know, <laughs> or yeah. would that money go into oh this is great I can take my business now expand it to like to fifty different countries at the same time you know what what's the answer to that and also what's the answer to um, I like to ask them if you if something were to happen to you. Um, and you were laid up for 90 days, what, what happens to the business? You know, is it still there or not? That starts the conversations because what happens is when you have a sellable business, you have options. You have many more options than most other business owners. And, and I'm yeah. talking about options that don't even revolve around selling the company. You know, it's options for strategic alliances, for partnerships. It's, it's options for, uh, to take advantage of opportunities that would come your way. Uh, mm. The number of people who come to me and say, hey, uh, I have someone who's interested in my business. Um, you know, can you help me? And then we kind of go through the process and this and that. Uh, they find it harder than someone who comes to me and says, you know what, I'm thinking I might want to sell my business in the next three years. Yeah. Let's, you know, can we start? And then what happens? Three months into our engagement, they come to me and say, someone has just called me and they want to, they want to talk about buying the business, you know? And, yeah. Um, and that's what happens often, you know, it's those opportunities and those opportunities are not just going to, they're not going to wait around for you. Uh, mm. If I'm one thing I tell to, uh, I, I like to tell business owners is always thinking if you, if you want to build something for the future and for today at the same time, think yeah. from the point of view of someone who's going to buy what you're creating, you know, it's kind of like a house. Right? You know, if, yeah. if, if you're, if you have a house and you're going to invite people over, what's that going to look like compared to, if you don't, know, if you're just a person who hoards and has a bunch of cats, you know, what's, yeah. and they, um, you know, that really helps them think about, okay, wait a minute, you know, do I really want to work 12 hours every single day, uh, answering the same questions, you know, 
dealing with the same clients who are just, you know, who, who, are, who are not really good clients, but I, I feel like mm. I, I, I have to keep them, you know, or would I rather free up, you know, four of those hours or take four of those hours and invest it in something else? You know, it could be that it could be something like, hey, that four hours I can invest it now going to this conference. You know, I can I can go for three days to this conference. And who am I going to meet at that conference you now that can change so many different things? Um, mm. So so the mindset for them often is I like to just talk about where they are in their day to day and what opportunities are they passing up by keeping with the same. So yeah. Yeah, I always say, look, if you're doing the same thing, and like the cliche goes, if you're doing the same thing and you expect different results, well, that's insanity. So yeah, why, of why keep up with that insanity? And I guess I guess that whole thing around the way, because uh, the, the main concept that's kind of hit me in all of this is even if you're not going to sell, if you treat your business as if you are from a marketing and promotion point of view, you're always going to do the best to increase the value that it is perceived to have. Um, so that, so if you actually treat it as if it's something that you want to sell for an X amount of, uh, and the people, the kind of person that comes to mind is someone like Stephen Bartlett, who I don't think when he started social chain, he thought he would be selling it for whatever it was, 200 million pounds or whatever it was. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's a really good learning from this. I think for all of our viewers and listeners is treat your business as if it needs to have that price tag on it at the, at the, at some point in the future, because um, that way you will all always create marketing and create assets that are sellable, even if you're not going to sell. It also makes it more tangible in the sense that Another marketing thing that uh, that I like to talk to people about, and it's related to the customer experience. You know, it's I like uh, it's it's I heard this from the states. I think it was from Dan Kennedy, and it was the question of, do you, um, uh, you know, do you, do you, do you take advantage of a sales to make a customer, or do you take advantage of a customer to make a sale? You know, and mm. and how do you answer that question? Now, a sellable business, what makes it valuable is when you have a book of customers that you can show our repeat customers, predictable customers, you know? And the question is, what are you doing from today to build that book? Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, one of my favorite examples was a wine company that had the biggest sale back in the early 2000s. It was Barefoot Winery to Gallo. And now Barefoot Winery is a winery that owned no vineyards, they owned no trucks, they owned, all they had was they, they did a third party with a wine and they sold it across the country. And, and the guy was telling us about the story when the one who sold the business and he said, look, I was sitting there and the chairman looks at me, you know, with his hands and goes, what the hell am I buying here? The, you have no trucks. You have no dinners. You, what am I buying? And he literally just pulled out a book and said, you're buying this, you're buying this book of customers. That's what you're buying. And the deal closed. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. They took the book of customers because they knew what they could do with it. And so when I talk to them about a sellable business can be very kind of, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, it's not concrete in some ways, it's kind of like highfalutin or the theoretical, but I like to bring it down to the trenches and I say, okay, well, uh, are you building customers or are you just building transactions? You know, if you're yeah. building transactions, you're gonna be like the, the pro athletes who make a lot of money and then five years later, they're broke, right? Or are you building, yeah. are you building an asset here from a customer base and this and that? And so, yeah. so the sellability, I then introduced through sellability, I introduced the concept of customer lifetime value. And then from customer lifetime value, I introduced front end to back end, you know, and, mm. and so, and that is concrete actions they can take on the marketing budget, for example, you know, so if they have a lead magnet and it costs them 10 pounds or whatever it is, you know, but they can get a customer with it, you know, but but then they're all they're worried about making a profit on the 10 pounds transaction they charge 20 yeah. and no one i'll say look just charge 10 you know or even take a loss on it if you can if you can take that customer who comes in and be able to get repeat purchases from them then it's a no-brainer you know it's yeah it, amazon, amazon prime is a perfect example of, of that when they offered free shipping they probably were losing money on the quote-unquote shipping but what happened yeah. people turned around and as soon as they subscribed they they started ordering the groceries. They started ordering things that they never ordered from before. 
Yeah. They, they, repeat, they did more and more transactions. They got more and more smart about what these people wanted. And the lifetime value of the customers shot through the roof. Oh, yeah. And the valuation yeah. of the business shot through the roof. Um, it, it, the same concept. So a lot of times when I talk about sellability to them, I say, look, to be more sellable, to be more valuable, you want to have a, a customer base that's repeatable. But how do we do that? Yeah. And then we get down into those details. I don't know if that helps yeah. in terms of the connection. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And I want to bring Vish in here, actually, because I know he's dying to ask Yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm yeah, jumping at the bit. Like, jumping at the bit to ask something. It's great. And I, mean, I, and I saw his eyes light up when you said customer lifetime yeah. value. Yeah, so, absolutely. Like, yeah, you know, the, the lifetime value is a very, very important thing. And I've got, I've, I've got a couple of questions. So maybe I'll ask a couple and I'll, yeah. I'll come back to the other ones later on. But, you know, it's, it's really interesting what you said, especially with, you know, the, the Dan Kennedy quote, um, you know, because some – the majority of businesses, unfortunately, are out of virtue of the situation of the business owner or the startup, will go into it to become a transactional business, right? And very uh, rarely or very late in the game will they then start thinking about the longevity of it and then, you know, repeat orders and stuff like that. But if you can get them almost at the right point or early enough into the cycle, then they can start, you know, structuring their processes and their marketing around it, which is really, really good. Um, have you have you ever come across, and this is a, a a mindset to marketing question. Okay. I have to explain that a bit, right? So have you ever come across a business where um, there's been reluctancy to, to adopt this approach uh, because of the fact that it's moving away from a model that's bringing in revenue right now, yeah. as opposed to maybe bringing in revenue a little bit later on? And how have you justified that marketing shift to them as well? Yeah, so when they, when they have the mindset shoot, where, where they're talking about the transactions and they're worried about... Uh, First thing I point out to them, look, it's not black and white. And then I point out the cost of acquiring a new customer versus the cost yeah. of, of a repeat customer. It, it, you're talking about a factor of five. It's not even, it's, it's not even, a, close, it's not even a close game. Uh, and so, you know, for example, I'll say to them, do you have their email address? Okay. How much does it cost you to send them an email? You know, and now how much does it cost for you to go on Facebook, to put an ad, to find them, to have them call and then, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think, so for the mindset, I, I like to put it in those, I, I like to step it back and say, okay, where do you want to invest your money? You know, usually that, that kind of perks up the air, it's, you know, and yeah. then say, well, would you rather have a customer that's five times more profitable or would you just have a, try to spend all your time trying to get new ones in to yeah. place the ones leaving out the door, you know? Uh, and that's why I love customer lifetime value so much is because it just tells you what's going on. You know, if, yeah. if the number starts going down, you know, there's something, something's going on here. And so what's going on is, is your ad spend going too high? Is your, is your customers leaving now too much or why are they leaving? What's going on? Um, whereas if you're just kind of like, Ooh, you know, then. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is, this is, a, I mean, the, the, the point that you're making is great because one of our, um, uh, one of our other podcast episodes is a guy called Alex Rosborough on it. We talk about data, the data-led approach to, okay. to marketing. And this is, this is a great way of breaking it down because you can almost look at it and go, hang on, where is that, where is that breaking apart? Where can we now fix this? Where can we put a finger in the leaky bucket? Yeah. Which is great. Um, and um, a, again, something that, um, that, that D Sarah and I mentioned on a, on a, on a podcast episode was again, you know, lifetime value that the fortune is in the follow up with your yeah, customers, exactly. you know, yeah. because it's cheaper to resell something or a follow on service to a, to a client than it is to acquire a new one. And unfortunately businesses get lost in that. So what's like the one, what the, the thing that's got you the most success with, I mean, can you give me an example of a, of a time where you've done that with a business where they have actually, you know, five X or 10 X their customer return? Like what? What was it that helped them do that? And what was the kind of the play, the marketing strategy you helped them with to do that? Because, you know, obviously this is the ultimate marketing podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we want to get some like real juicy bits of information from you, George. Like what was the one thing that you did that got the most amount of success for your client? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the one marketing, the, the, the lady who was doing the marketing thing, she got a big return on the back of that because we, we talked about other stuff too. So for hers was more of a differentiation, how to articulate you know, to, and, and that helped her attract a much better clientele. So, so for example, she had a, uh, she was telling me how she had a customer who was, you know, like a weirdo, like, you know, saying that the whole company's dependent upon, upon, you know, her. And she's like, well, 
why are you putting all the eggs in one basket? You know, that, that's completely, that, that's beyond stupid. Um, but it was just one of those clients, I think they liked the drama. You know? <laughs> and of course, of course, the, um, my, the advice I gave to that is get rid of that customer right away. And the time you free up from that customer, you're going to find three others, that, which are much better. And so they eventually did that. And so I think that, you know, that, that really helped them. Um, but really it's, you know, on a couple of the other engagements, it, it was a mindset shift as to how they, uh, where they put their marketing. So, uh, I had a client and they did entertainment and one of their, one of their sub segments was restaurants, you know, so they will do the, you know, bring the music to the restaurant and this and that. And, and so that, that segment had kind of like, uh, uh, it was kind of stuck. Right. And so we were, so I was talking to the marketing guy and that, and we were talking about, and he was telling me the messaging they're doing and all that. And, and now this, this company had an impressive talent base in terms of the musicians they can bring and all that. Uh, and they were leading with that. And the point I made, and uh, uh, I raised the point, I said, look, a restaurant owner doesn't really care about that. What they care about is the environment and how those patrons going to come back again and again. That's what they care about, right? You could, I, I, I said, you could put Bozo the Clown. You could put like, you know, uh, people singing crickets. It doesn't matter, you know, but they want the ambiance, you know, the ambiance to bring the repeat customers in a very hyper uh, competitive uh, industry like F&B. And, um, and that's what they did. You know, they, they did that and it, it helped. They, they fine tuned their messaging to talk to the owner of where he was, the, the restaurant owners, where he was, you know, the, you know, is he worried about looking like a fool to his, to his family because he opened the restaurant, there's a hundred chairs and they're all empty. And so just, it was just a fine tune there. And that's, that's where it, uh, but often it's that mindset shift, but always to talk about, I like to talk about it in practical terms where they can, where, where, where they can, where people can relate to. Uh, yeah. restaurants are a favorite example. You know, we all yeah. have experiences yeah. with restaurants. We all know a yeah. restaurant that's good and one that's crap and, and what's the difference between them and when you get treated well and when you get treated not so well. Um, and I, I write in, in my emails, I write about this a lot. Um, uh, I will talk about, I talk about the customer experience a lot because it drives the predictability of the customer base, which drives, helps drive one of the factors helped drive the value of the business. And I, I gave an example, uh, a perfect example right now. So last year I published the book in the US and, I'm, and I was trying to print it here in the UAE and I couldn't find a good printer there that was reasonably priced. And um, so it just wasn't getting printed and I was like, okay, I'm just got to ship it from the US and this and that. And in my networking group, we met this one guy I interviewed him and then we we're talking, I told him my this dilemma with the book. He sat down, he asked me the questions, really got, you know, and then said, okay, give me the specs. I gave him the specs. He gave me a quote, which was a better quote, you know, but, but he had asked the right questions before that. Uh, and then I said, okay, you know, let me, you know, give me a sample, you know, like the uh, proof. And so he went, came back and he said, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the you know, your book is the insides black and white. So we can actually reduce this by 30% and reduce it even further. And I'm like, okay, that's, you know, that's done. That it was a done deal, but not only a done deal for the books, a done deal as to how he handled the whole relation, how he handled it yeah. from beginning to end, you know, and I already told, you know, I told him, I put it in the email that he already has now, he doesn't, he doesn't know it yet but he already has future orders coming his way. Like for example, we have a networking group that we're launching and they need banners. They need those big old flag things, whatever, they, you know, he's going to be the printer who's going to get those jobs because, yeah. you know, because of this incident, incident now, unless he doesn't screw it up because of this incident and how he dealt with it and how he built what I called, he built a relationship. You know, mm -hmm. he did the right stuff. He listened. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't crazy about the transaction. He didn't care about the, about the, you know, it might've been a, a difference in price of a hundred quid at the end of the day, yeah. but he's going to, the next project's going to be about 500, you know, he's going to make it up more and really quickly. 
So um, I'm conscious like we're coming towards the end of our time here, George. So what we're going to do is going to do a quick fire Q&A. So each of us is going to ask you a question. So we'll see how, how much time we might do one, we might do two lots. So I'll start and then hand over to Vish and D. So one of my questions I'm curious to hear your answer to is where you talk about helping businesses transform into a VIP business, like just like in a, like a couple of sentences, how do you do that? Okay. Yeah, so we look at where they are now, uh, and then yeah. we look at those criteria. Can they stand out? Can they scale up? And are they attractive to an investor or buyer? When we can answer yes to those three, they pretty much have become a VIP business because they have the systems, the processes, they have the team, they have the, the messaging, they have, they have everything in place you know, to do so. Okay, so my quick fire round question is uh, a lifestyle business or a business that should uh, grow and scale? I, I think that I, I think that really depends upon them. So, you know, some people are just happy to have a lifestyle business, you know, they, they can have a lifestyle business, they can take enough profits out of the lifestyle business to invest to do other stuff to, mm. to protect themselves. Um, and then they're happy the, the, the business it could be like a doctor, right? He has his own practice. He doesn't want to deal with employee. He doesn't want to deal with any of that headache. Yeah. He's done. He hangs up the shingle. He's, you know, that's fine. <laughs> I, I think it just really depends on, on, on the motivation of why you started the business in the first place. Yeah. Uh, can good marketing fix bad mindset? I don't see why. I don't see why not, but it's very, very difficult. You know, yeah. it's until they accept it, it it's, you know, it, it, there's, there's so many, this is a, another thing that we have to remember for a business owner. There's so many things going on in their heads that they're not where we think they are. So I might, I might give him this lead magnet and I'm like, okay, he's, he's excited. He's ready to go, but he's actually not, yeah. you know, he's, yeah. he might have, he might have stuff like, well, I've already tried this or my mom told me I was going to be a failure. Yeah, you, 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 you know, it, there's so much there and that's why you have to go to where they really are and not where, where you hope they are, where you think they are. So if they're stubborn and never want to change their mindset, that's going to be really tough, you know, uh, because they're not going to attract the type of customers they, that would be the good customers anyways, because their mindset would be the wrong mindset for that. Yeah. If you were starting your business again now, what was, what's the key thing that you would do? Oh, I think, uh, I, I can tell you what I would do differently from when I started mine. Yeah. Uh, audience list. The list is the list is the critical. Ooh, um, it is I think we, gold. I think a lot of us, we, we build a product and we try to find an audience for the product. I think the audience is much more, get to know an audience, mm -hmm. get to know what they're looking for and what they want, and then build the solutions around that and be flexible about that. Uh, I think that's, I think that's the number one thing. I think uh, it, cool. you can have the best marketing in the world. If you, if you, if I'm selling top of the line, weightlifting equipment, Olympic training equipment, and my list is 85 year old women. <laughs> it, it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna make a lot of sales on that one. Dubai or Chicago? Oh God, Dubai. Um, yeah. Chicago, oh. Dubai gets hot. You know, it's hot now, it's, but Chicago, man, those, those winters, no way. Um, I, 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 like, I grew up in the snow and the cold. I, I prefer the heat. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> interesting. A shy town all over for you, man. Um, <laughs> uh, Okay, buy an existing business or build a new business to sell. Oh, I, I think that nice question. I think that that's a good one, but I think it depends on the existing business, right? If the existing business is optimized, it, it, that it's a great asset, then then you're 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 already running with the ball. Um, yeah. So, uh, and if it's not, if it's not, then you don't you don't don't waste your time on it. Yeah. Thanks, George. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks. It's been a pleasure to have you with us today and getting us thinking about what we need to do to make our businesses sellable, whether we intend to sell them or not. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Now, how do people get in touch with you? We're, we'll obviously put your details in our show notes, but um, what's the best way, which platform is the best for people to contact you? Um, probably um, they can just contact me through the website or a LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn. They, okay. they can sign up for like uh, I have a, I send out daily emails and I also post on LinkedIn daily mm -hmm. so they can just come into there it's uh, they'll, they'll learn a, it's it's fun you know it's I, I'm very uh, how do we say I'm very uncorporate so I, I like just I like being direct <laughs> right you know so um, but yeah yes yeah. that's where they can that's, that's where they can reach it.
Best way on LinkedIn, George. Best way on LinkedIn. <laughs> we'll make sure your LinkedIn details are there. So thank you very much for joining us. And to all our listeners, thank you for listening in today. Remember to comment, like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and whichever channel you prefer to listen to podcasts on, whether it's Apple, Spotify, Sketcher, or any other podcast, podcast platform. Thank you all for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode where we'll be sharing more marketing tips, tricks, and ninja latest trends. So see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank now. you.